edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find our shows online at rce-cast.com. You can also follow me personally, tweeting about HPC stuff and generally computer-related stuff. Uh, you follow me at Brock Palin, all one word. Again, also, I have Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems on loan to us again. Uh, he's also a major developer of OpenMPI. So, Jeff, thanks again for your time. Sure, Brock. I'm always happy to do these things. I always learn new things. And by the same token, uh, on uh, on my blog recently, on blogs.cisco.com, I've been trying to demystify a bunch of internals of uh, MPI kinds of things. So I'd love to hear what your questions are. If people have questions, please uh, feel free to email them to me, tweet them to me, whatever, and uh, I'll answer them on the blog. Yeah, I've really been enjoying the last string of uh, a couple of demystification of some of the things that MPI libraries actually do in practice, and so that's that's been quite an enjoyable read. Good. All right, well, what are we talking about today? Uh, Today we're actually talking to uh, a guy who works on one of the very first libraries I ever used, which is the AMD Core Math Library. It's AMD's implementation of some of the blahs and LAPAC and some other things like that. Yeah, our guest today is uh, Chip Freitag from AMD, and he's calling in on a phone, so his quality may not be that great, but Chip, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and let us know what your position is. Sure, Brock, and uh, thanks for having me on the show here. Uh, I'm um, a developer in the AMD math library section. I've uh, grown up with the group. We now actually have a a group of people working on math libraries at AMD. Uh, Back when I started on it, it was uh, me and and one other guy, Tim Wilkins. Uh, I started at AMD 18 years ago, Uh, started in the marketing position, actually a technical marketing position. Uh, I have a degree in aerospace engineering engineering from the University of Texas um, and have uh, uh, been in the computer industry for about 30 years working on a variety of uh, embedded applications and communications and networking types of, of, of applications and then uh, eventually here at AMD working on floating point math libraries, which is the closest I've gotten to using my aerospace engineering degree. So why don't we dive straight into this. Uh, what is the ACML? ACML is the AMD Core Math Library. It's a collection of uh, floating point math routines heavily used in scientific and engineering types of applications. Uh, It's uh, relatively popular in the high performance computing industry. Uh, It consists of the the BLAST linear algebra package, um, LAPAC, a set of FFTs, and a collection of random number generators. Uh, the, the library is available in, of, uh, as, as you're used to with BLAST and LAPAC routines. We have this available in uh, uh, all the, the precisions that you would expect, single, double, uh, single precision complex and double precision complex as well. So well, what's the history of the ACML? How did it come into existence? You know, why is AMD offering it? That kind of thing. So that's an interesting question. Back in, um, well, gosh, I guess it was about the the 96 time frame, it seems like. Maybe, uh, I'm sorry, it was about around the year 2000 when AMD was inventing the AMD 64 architecture. We had taken the the Intel uh, x86 32-bit architecture and extended it to uh, to to uh, allow 64-bit operands and 64-bit addressing space. Back when we were uh, working on that as a, as a Skunk Works project, we realized that, um, um, uh, that you know, you know, you know, high-performance computing types of uh, programs would be willing to take advantage of this in, in, a, in, a, in a big way. Uh, at the time, the only math library that existed was, um, um, well, the only vendor-driven math library was, of course, MKL, but uh, the BLAST and LAPAC routines that were out there were um, were only available in 32-bit flavors. Uh, and in addition, the C and Fortran compilers that were available at the time would only emit 32-bit um, uh, in instruction streams. So it, as part of a larger effort to, uh, to, to develop a mer- mature set of OS and compiler offerings for, that the industry could use to run on our machines, we also realized that we needed to do uh, math libraries. So um, a, a project was developed, and uh, at the time, uh, Tim Wilkins had just started at AMD, and he had a, a propensity for taking um, – uh, 
uh, compute kernels, especially DGEM, and tweaking them for x87 and um, <clears throat> in those days the 3D Now instruction set, and making them run as fast as you can make them run. And we turned that into a set of um, library routines that uh, we were able to, to make available as a product offering. In addition, at the time we were working on um, uh, a, a set of math transcendental functions, you know, sine and cosine and exponent log and those sorts of things. And I, I personally worked on that and uh, 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 worked with MAG to, to turn those into a product <clears throat> and um, get those ported for the 64-bit architecture that we were, that we were going to bring to market. Uh, and those two efforts kind of converged such that uh, when we were finished with the um, – the math transcendental functions, it was a natural extension for us to then go to NAG and um, um, have them start producing, uh, have them start collaborating, collaborating with us to produce the ACML library. So I noticed on the ACML manual that, and you just mentioned there a few times, NAG comes up a couple of times. What, how close is the relationship with NAG and NAG's numerical algorithms group from the UK? That's correct. Uh, the, the relationship with NAG is, is reasonably close. We um, um, work with a, a fairly small group of people there. Uh, NAG, as, you probably, as many people probably know, um, offers a, a relatively popular statistical library that's uh, used as a reference in, uh, by many people. Uh, we license, ended up licensing portions of ACML from NAG. Uh, as, as, for instance, we, we license their LAPAC code, and that's what we use rather than the standard NetLive LAPAC code. Uh, they've um, done a, an extensive amount of work with that, um, solving some of the bugs that you find in the, in the NetLive code, but also introducing um, um, OpenMP pragmas to, to make that um, multi-threaded. So we, we license that code from them, and that's, that's what we use for LAPAC in the ACML library. Uh, we also work with them, have worked with them very closely, especially um, uh, in the beginnings of the library to productize the BLAST library uh, and the FFTs. And we also license the random number generator code from, from NAG. Uh, we can continue to have a, a fairly close relationship with them, and um, uh, we use them as, as technical experts on, on a variety of subjects. So who uses the ACML? The ACML user base is um, uh, pretty much anybody who's got um, – an, an AMD computer, although it's not limited to just ACML, AMD processors, um, anybody who's got uh, an AMD processor and uh, needs to, to run a bunch of math code, um, uh, the, the typical user is either a, a, you know, anywhere from a university student on up to you know, the, the, uh, the managers at the national labs, um, uh, the, the people that, that have to maintain the the software base for the for for the labs. Um, uh, invariably, if they've got AMD, you know, if they've got machines such as Craze that uh, have AMD processors in them, they've got ACML in their uh, bag of tricks uh, for for their for their user base. Um, in addition, uh, oil and gas customers are, are big users of, of ACML. They, they utilize our FFTs quite a bit. Um, financial institutions use us for the random number generators that we have. It's a wide variety. Uh, when I look at the, uh, the download information for the library, it's, it's a who's who of um, practically every university in the world and um, er, practically every Fortune 500 company. So you mentioned in there, the, uh, this is focused on AMD processors, but it works on non-AMD processors. Uh, what, what's the reasoning behind that, and how much work is that for you? Well, the reasoning behind that is because um, I have unfortunately yet to see a shop that has only AMD processors. And, um, uh, you know, a common user request is that they want to have one uh, executable that runs on all, all the various machines that they have. Uh, they also need to make sure that they uh, get similar answers on on different machines. So running the same library pretty uh, pretty much ensures that you're going to get similar results based on different based on the uh, different machines. 
it's it's a, a little bit of effort for us. Obviously, we have to maintain a a, a set of Intel machines that we do our testing on, uh, and um, we actually have. Um, uh, implemented specific kernels targeting Intel processors. So for instance, we have specific uh, Woodcrest and the Halem kernels for, for our um, matrix multiply kernels. And we have to test those and make sure that they work on the, on the, you know, in, the in various applications. So uh, we do spend some effort to make sure that that works the way we expect it to. And, and uh, we've gotten some good feedback about the performance that we have on, on no. other machines. I would imagine that that's going to, you know, especially over time, going to entail quite a bit more software engineering for you because your platforms, you know, AMD versus Intel, you're kind of diverging a bit in terms of features and chip functionality and things like that. Is this expected, a trend that's expected to continue? It, well, you're right there. It's not going to get any easier, that's for sure. Uh, in the most recent generation of, of products that we have, uh, you, everybody's aware of the AMD bulldozer architecture that's out there. Uh, we haven't actually launched the product yet, but it's a, a well-known quantity now. Uh, the, we we uh, have in bulldozer um, the, the um, uh, not only AVX instructions, but we have uh, FMA4, a four operand fuse multiply add instruction. And we uh, are currently working on an ACML for that and, and using the FMA4 architecture. Our competitor has chosen a different path for its future uh, products, uh, FMA3, um, and we will eventually support that as well. And at that time, then, you know, we will have to, to do work associated with that. So we'll end up with two uh, code paths supporting uh, FMA architectures. And it, of course, doesn't make the, the, the library manager's life any easier because the matrix of, of test cases just, you know, doubles for cases like that. So why implement these things as a library? Why not um, add this to, say, like compiler optimizations and work with some of the compiler vendors? Well, um, that, uh, working with the compiler vendors certainly makes life easier for the guy building the application. If he can code something and the compiler recognizes it uh, and, and just does the right thing, that's, that's the perfect world for the, for the guy who's writing software. He doesn't have to think too much about it. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I think the opportunities for that is, is relatively limited and tends to be more useful in benchmarking um, uh, capability than anything else. I think for the real world, uh, a lot of people are targeting these specific routines and uh, expect to link to a library. So that's the the path that we've chosen. And, and then with a library, you can cover many, many more cases than you could in you know uh, compiler heuristics. I think. So compared to say a compiled matrix multiply code uh, that a generic user would write. How much better performance would you expect on, say, the current top-of-the-line AMD core using ACML versus that user's code? Well, uh, I think that's a difficult question to answer because you have to give me a baseline. Um, um, I, what I will say about that is that uh, ACML is able to achieve on the order, you know, in the on in the range of 90% efficiency on a matrix multiply kernel, depending on the machine that you're running it on. Um, and, you know, if the, if the compiler can do that well, then great. Uh, and if it can do that well for a variety of problem sizes, that's even better. ACML is tuned to run um, just about as well as you can get out of the machine uh, for a variety of different problem sizes. Now, is ACML uh, multi-threaded and, and NUMA aware, or is this strictly serial stuff? It is. We we provide the library in both uh, both flavors right now. We we have a single-threaded version for for people who want to do threading in their own applications and don't want to have to worry about the library, you know, uh, oversubscribing threads. Uh, so they can call a single-threaded ACML version, and, and, and it will do what they expect it to do. We do provide a multi-threaded version. It is, um, uh, to some extent, NUMA aware. It is written using OpenMP Pragmas. If, if you have a program and you know you've got some really large problems that you want to solve and, and uh, your program is not multi-threaded, you can, for instance, let's say you had um, <clears throat> 
you had a, a, a you know a lot of 3D FFTs that you want to run, uh, you could call the OpenMP version of ACML, and it will run. It will multi-thread the the uh, the one-dimensional transforms that you need to do, and um, and take maximum advantage of the machine that way. Now, this is interesting because this kind of blends into Brock's earlier question of compiler versus lab library here. So if you're using OpenMP, do you have any influence on the compiler group um, who, you know, designs this stuff? Or are you strictly, a, you know, a, an actual user of OpenMP and uh, not so much an implementer? We... We have people here in on the same floor that we work with um, in both GCC and OpenMP. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Open64 compiler groups. So we do have the opportunity to provide feedback. We also have a, a relatively good relationship with PGI. And um, you know, when, for instance, if we find bugs, you know, we we get pretty pretty quick service on uh, on turnaround on on things like that. We do have the opportunity to, to provide feedback. Um, um, oh, you know, in the vein of the earlier question about uh, specific optimizations, we haven't really done very much of that. But uh, certainly, uh, you know, if we find issues or you know code generation problems or something of that nature, especially with some of the earlier releases of the compilers, we're we're able to to uh, to talk to people directly about those types of things. So, so far we've been talking about mostly using the library to get good performance out of these processors. Are there any other reasons a user would be, um, you know, it'd be a good idea for them to use ACML or some sort of library over writing their own code? Sure. ACML provides um, standard interfaces for the BLAST and the LA pack. So you can use it and be assured that you're going to get relatively good performance out of the library and and know that you're going to get the correct answers, uh, uh, the same answers that you would get if you were using the, the standard libraries. If you're using the random number generators, we provide, a, um, as an example, we provide a lot of uh, functionality there. Uh, you probably wouldn't want to write uh, that on your own uh, unless you have a, uh, a PhD in statistics. That stuff's really hard to figure out. Um, uh, the FFTs, we've we've done an extensive amount of work there, and um, you know I'm, I'm sure you, a user may have uh, his own special needs for FFTs, and that might drive. Uh, uh, a, uh, you know the the need to to write their own algorithms, but I think they'll find that what we've done is is very usable in a wide variety of applications. So you mentioned earlier, um, you kind of touched lightly on some of the optimizations that you do. You mentioned vector processing units and OpenMP and things like that. But you could, could you go in a little more detail? Uh, obviously, without going into any proprietary information. But you know, what do you do above what you know the, the casual physicist, for example, would do? And you know, sure, understanding that this stuff is good. kind of complicated, but give, give us a taste of how complicated it is. Okay, that's a good question, and um, it, it, allow me to um, to um, um, give kudos to one of my coworkers. Uh, uh, Dr. Tim Wilkins is is uh, one of our engineers. He's based in California, in Sunnyvale, and and uh, I mentioned him at the uh, earlier in in the show. Uh, Tim Tim's been working for for a long time doing optimization. Tim has a PhD in physics and was uh, early on interested in extracting good performance on some of his applications on on uh, especially on AMD processors, but also on Intel processors. Uh, Tim's our secret weapon, and uh, to, to be quite honest, and and Tim has an, uh, an intimate knowledge of the architecture of the part. Uh, currently, he's working actually in the architecture group and providing workloads. Uh, to to the guys that design the chips so that they can see what kind of performance they get, you know, back when the design is in the in the um, uh, the um, um, uh, VHDL stage, the um, you know the um, um, the modeling stage. So Tim knows the application extremely well. He knows FFTs and 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 uh, gems and what they're used for, and he he's very familiar with the the architecture of the chip. So he's able to write this code in a way that uh, extracts the maximum performance from the part. Um, uh, after he's written, you know, the basic software, we are able to take that and then, uh, you know. Make it a general purpose routine and and package it with with all of the uh, the 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 uh, 
interfaces that the the stand you know the blast and LAPEC routines need. We're able to do tuning on at a block level to make sure that uh, we t- take maximum advantage of of uh, cache hierarchies and things like that. Uh, we do a, f- a fair amount of testing on our machines that we have access to to make sure that. Uh, uh, things work well with the multi-core arch- architectures that we have. You know, we have some machines now that are uh, four sockets and eight cores, and you know, that's 32, 32 cores on one machine. So it takes a, a, a fair amount of effort to make that run well. Uh, so, so those are that's the, that's the basic flow that we have. Um, uh, generally, we understand the architecture much better than the, the typical physicist is going to have time. To, to do, and so they're able to take advantage of our expertise. So let me ask you about this then. Uh, the um, you know both Intel and you have have come up with concepts. Uh, I think you have different names for it, but hyper threading, right? So um, multiple threads of execution on the, on the same core. Do you guys take advantage of that? Are there any kernels that benefit from that, or is the conventional HP PC wisdom of you know turn off all forms of hyper threading uh, a better adage here. Our product offerings today do actually do not provide any hyper threading. Um, it, it, as everybody's aware, Intel's Intel's machines do provide hyper threading. And for H, the 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 concept behind hyper threading is that you had resources on the machine that were underutilized by your application. So if you ran more than one thread. Then you could more fully utilize those uh, the, those resources, and 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 the, the the typical case was that the floating point unit was underutilized. Uh, as an example, you're running a bunch of uh, sines and cosines. Well, the the instruction mix on sines and cosines is is relatively ad rich, not very many multiplies, but also there's a lot of branches and things like that. So the floating point unit is 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 relatively underutilized. If you run multiple threads on that same uh, on that same machine, hyper threading them, uh, all of those all of those integer threads can probably run at full speed uh, and still have plenty of uh, floating point bandwidth left over. So that was the original impetus behind hyper threading. Uh, in in our case, we have not done that. Uh, we the bulldozer architecture offers or introduces a, a new feature that's not strictly hyper-threading, it, it, but it is a sharing of the floating point unit between two integer cores. Um, uh, we, we don't do anything specific to take advantage of, you know, to, to tune for the hyper-threading. And in fact, on Intel uh, machines, if you're running a workload that really uses the, the, uh, the floating point unit, DGEM as the classic example, uh, our recommendation is to turn off hyper-threading. So back on the library, uh, what fraction of your code, um, when people think about you know really crazy optimizations, they think about assembly a lot. How much assembly is actually being used versus how much like you know higher level languages, you know C, Fortran, C plus plus. Okay, that's a good. That's a great question. Uh, to to at the high level, of course. Uh, the uh, majority of ACML is written in Fortran. All of the bla- all of the uh, higher higher level BLAST routines and um, uh, the FFTs, the random num- number generators, those are all written in Fortran. So we require a Fortran compiler for ACML. The the heavy lifting and the tuned portions of ACML, those are written in 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 assembly. Those are handwritten in assembly language. Um, uh, so. The, the the important parts of that are, are uh, the, the one-dimensional uh, FFTs and the gem kernels that we have in, in all the four precisions. Uh, things like uh, uh, DTR, DTRSM and DTRMM, those higher-level uh, BLAST routines are written in Fortran themselves, but they uh, in, in the end they end up calling the assembly language gem kernels to get the real work done. So if you were to profile a typical application that's really taking advantage of ACML, you'll, you'll see some Fortran entry points in there, but the, the library will spend the majority of its work in an assembly kernel. So is, your, is, is the ACML polymorphic in the sense that it senses what processor chip is, is being used underneath and selects the appropriate kernel at runtime, or is that a, a link time decision? 
it, it is a runtime decision, and uh, or, or traditionally has been a runtime decision. Uh, our ACML5, which we're working on right now, is going to have it has uh, a, an exception to that, which I'll discuss. Uh, in with the um, uh, SSE code paths, we look at two things. We do look at processor um, ID to know if uh, we we need to run, uh, for instance, a Nehalem kernel or a Woodcrest kernel or something of that nature. But we also look at the instruction set uh, available as well. If if uh, if an instruction uh, if a processor has uh, SSE instructions, then we we know we can take advantage of those. Uh, with the the um, the new architecture, we we have um, um, a, a a break from that. Uh, with ACML5, we will introduce a, a new set of libraries that are specific for AVX and FMA4. Uh, we will continue to have a version of the library built to support SSE and SSE2 code paths. So in that case, it's a link time decision. And along the same lines of, you know, you were talking about uh, auto sensing and uh, having hand tuned assembly. How closely do you track hardware releases with, with your software releases? So, you know, a new chip comes out with new features that are really great for you. You know, you've mentioned the, uh, the new bulldozer and whatnot. But uh, in, in general, how, how much do you have to keep them in sync? Well, uh it's it's been crucial for us to keep in relatively well in sync with with our hardware releases. Um, you know, you know, if uh, we have customers who are buying this, these machines to uh, to extract good performance out of them, so they need a library, they need software to to work well on them. Uh, and uh, of course, the software won't work well on them unless we have libraries to support it. So it's. Uh, we we tend to time our library releases, our, our major library releases, for um, a new hardware release as well. So there's been uh, talk about some other stuff you guys have been doing. Uh, have you been doing much work optimizing for non-traditional CPU platforms? Yes, uh, that's a, a great segue. We have um, uh, if. If you go on our web page and look, and, and I guess I could put a plug in for our developer central web page, if you uh, either if you went to amd.com and, and just added AC, and searched for ACML, you would find us. Um, uh, but there's also devcentral.amd.com, and you can get there uh, through through that link as well. Uh, you will see that we've been busily working on a, a new set of libraries to support our OpenCL uh, software development kit offerings. Uh, and, and this library is uh, designed to be used with our GPU products. Um, as pretty much everybody is aware now that GPU is a, a big up-and-coming thing in uh, high-performance computing. And it just so happens that AMD has GPU product offerings. So we've been working on libraries to support the use of these GPUs in, in um, um, uh, high-performance computing. The, the tack that we've taken is we are supporting this through the OpenCL uh, program, programming environment. And to date, we have delivered, and in fact, we just released the version 1.4 of the AMD parallel processing primitives for uh, processing, parallel processing math library uh, to support uh, the, the um, OpenCL 2.5 SDK. Uh, the, the library currently has a set of blasts, a uh, set of level uh, three blasts routines and a set of uh, complex to complex um, uh, single precision and double precision FFT functions. If you go look at the, the download page pages for um, for this, you'll you'll find uh, the the 1.4 version of, of our OpenCL math libraries. So on a previous show, we had Jack Dungara and some of his lab on here talking about. A, the plasma library and its add-on uh, magma um have you guys looked at any of these other weird approaches to um doing the blahs in la pack that's that's a, a another good question uh, i'm not sure i'd call them weird i would say that uh uh given the the complexities of programming with uh uh 
you know, heterogeneous uh, compute nodes and with the, the many cores available in GPU types of products that you, you have to start taking approaches such as those. And the, of course, the answer to the question is yes, we have been looking at those. Um, and um, in fact, are collaborating with the University of Tennessee guys to um, to have an implementation of Magma supporting our OpenCL libraries and our GPUs. So that sounds pretty cool. Uh, let me ask you a follow-on question to that then. Um, in terms of polymorphism, again, um, you know, are these libraries going to be polymorphic in the sense that they can determine not only what kind of CPU is there, but also whether there is a GPU present or not. And the reason I ask this is because you said earlier in the conversation that your customers like having one executable no matter what kind of machine it is. So does that extend to, to this realm as well, that it auto senses whether a GPU is there and does GPU things or falls back to optimize CPU things? Uh, yes, our, our OpenCL library, which is, of course, designed to be run on GPUs, uh, can also generate um, code uh, and will run on the CPU. The OpenCL compiler that we're, that we're providing uh, can generate code for either CPU or GPU, uh, and, and the library supports both as well. Uh, for instance, in the example of applications, uh, you can control which of the processors that you run on uh, via a an environment variable, you can restrict restrict it to running on the CPU or on the GPU. Uh, in in a perfect world, of course, we would divide workloads between uh, both the CPU and take advantage of all the CPU cores that are available and all the GPU cores. We're not quite there yet, but that's uh, but that's uh, certainly a goal that we we would like to work towards. So, what's the licensing for ACML? Uh, licensing for ACML is is relatively straightforward. We have a uh, we, we do have a proprietary license for ACML, but we basically allow you to to use it uh, as long as you're not in the Republic of North Korea and other such blacklisted com countries. Um, uh, we uh, uh, provide this for free. You can download it from our web page. Uh, we have a, a click through license agreement that you're presented with when you install the product. Uh, we also have changed our licensing recently to allow um, uh, a click-through redistribution agreement. So uh, we, we, we now grant redistribution rights for, for people who want to use ACML and bake it into their products that they, that they need to ship to other customers. So you mentioned a couple of uh, upcoming features, like you said, in ACML5 and things like that. Are there any other uh, things that you can publicly discuss that's on the roadmap and up and coming? The primary focus for ACML 5.0 is support for our bulldozer processors. We'll have uh, 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 tuned uh, DGEM and SGEM kernels in this release now, and also uh, uh, complex to complex one-dimensional transforms. In a, in a, in a future 5.1 release, we'll be adding more of the BLAST kernels. Uh, I'm, I'm personally working on the, the ZGEM kernel at, at the moment, and we'll, we'll also uh, 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 round out the, all the precisions in the gems, and that will take care of uh, all of the level 3 BLAST that, that uh, are, are available. Um, we will... Uh, of course, be extending our OpenCL libraries in, in the future and adding um, um, more support for our, our new GPUs. Okay, well, Chip, thanks very much for your time. Uh, what's the website and stuff where we can find more information on ACML? Sure, the best place to find ACML is at devcentral.amd.com. And, of course, you can also get there if you go through amd.com and do a search for ACML. And thanks for having me on the show, guys. Appreciate it. This was great. Oh, thank you very much.